begin our second contest. Well, thank you. Yeah. Here to lead us with the international speech contest is our international speech contest toastmaster, Tiffany Salinko Howard. seconds your heart will explode and everybody will think you had a heart attack. Or there's computer generated things now that they can actually cause energy to converge on one area, like one three dimension uh, spot in the universe, like right here. And they can make a little explosion go off. Uh, they haven't quite gotten it down to the exact atom, but I guess they could actually get down to an atomic explosion. So, pretty scary stuff, man. Any of you ever watched the TV show, Scare Tactics? They talk about insanity viruses, <coughs> aliens, snakes, the uh, organ harvesting facilities. Seen that channel? Well, long ago, back in the 1930s, uh, there was another scare tactic that several people were using. They were using yellow journalism to create a scare among the people. My title, Reefer Madness, it was a movie, one of the ten worst movies of all time, <coughs> rated by the critics. It was about rape, violence, 
manslaughter all because somebody smoked some weed, smoked some cannabis, that committed suicide, that became insane, read for madness. It was a 1936 movie. It was began with as a propaganda film to drive hemp out of the marketplace. It then became a, an exploitation film, and then in the 70s, that's when I learned about it, it was a real satire. We were laughing about the whole thing. But what's going on, and what they should have been telling, and at the end of this movie, they end with, tell your children about these things. <laughs> They're going to go insane if they ever try marijuana. Reefer is another term for marijuana, in case anyone doesn't know about that. But the real facts are, the hemp plant is actually, you can produce three times as much hemp for fabric <coughs> as you can cotton. It's better quality, it's softer, and the fiber is stronger. It's better quality. Hemp also was uh, used for paper. And at that time, people were using the pulp process and using uh, a mixture of uh, chemicals and pulp and then making paper out of that. Well, if they used hemp, they could get four times as much paper out of an acre of land as they could forest. Hemp has great uses. As I mentioned, cloth, food, actually, the Sears catalog had maple syrup and hashish. Hashish is the THC within the plant that gives you the hallucinogenic effect or feeling. They'd mix it together and they sold it out of the Sears catalog. Back then. <laughs> I don't know. They made rope and webbing, oils, lubricants, some of the best lubricant on the market, and building materials with hemp. It was going to be a billion dollar product back in the 1930s. Except that fact that there were a few influencers back then. <clears throat> the uh, 1930s was reminiscent of the Prohibition era, and the federal government came up with the FBI and Elliot Ness. Well, they also came up with the Federal <coughs> Bureau of Narcotics at that time, and they decided they were going to take hemp and make it the, wor the strongest, worst Schedule One drug on the market. Worse than cocaine and other drugs like that. At that time, also, William Randolph Hearst was the big publishing magnate, and he owned vast forest land. And he realized that if he could drive hemp out of the market, that his land would be worth four times as much. DuPont, at that time, was also part of this conspiracy because they had originally been explosives in the, sec uh, the First World War, and then they went into, well, what are we going to do during peacetime? So they made rayon and nylon. If they could drive hemp out of, them, out, out, out of the market, their product is going to be worth much more. And bringing it all together was the Mellon Bank, because they were, inter they were in bed with each other. <laughs> they were married with cousins, etc., related to all these. So the four of them were all together during the Prohibition. What this did was they outlawed hemp. They took a $2 amount of hemp and they put a $100 tax on it so that it was cost prohibitive to grow hemp. So therefore their nylon, their rayon flourish as well as their wood products. But what did this do? It created a big black market. Nobody ever drew, drove marijuana out of the market. And what was happening around that time? 1930s? El Capone? Syndicate? Uh, well, yes, that's right. There was associated corruption associated with this as well. There were bad drugs on the market, sex slaves, child prostitution. It was all happening. Extortion, theft, you name it. Well, today, they're finally making some sense. They're actually starting to consider lowering uh, marijuana from the Schedule 1 to maybe 3, 4, or 5. I thought maybe they would actually have been news in the last day or two, but I didn't hear, read of any. So, soon I think we're going to lower that standard down to something more reasonable. But what else are we going to do? There's still a federal standard up there. And 
I'm proposing that we actually, what's going on is they're going to the states and they're saying, well, let all the states know the second most powerful big government piece out there. My opinion is that we should go to local government and let local governments decide how they prefer handling that situation because it's really not that bad. In fact, the THC in marijuana actually kills cancer cells when it's in the system. And the FDA would still have jurisdiction over everything. So the real madness was how this act actually got through Congress, how they lobbied it all through, and we should really consider redoing that and revising our Marijuana Tax Act. stayed and we enjoyed ourselves. So Simba 
turned from an unlikely friend, looked like it was going to be big trouble, into something that I still treasure this at this point, and he's been gone nine years already. <clears throat> Next, I want to talk a little bit about another tremendous friend that I had had in my life, my late husband, Mark. Our first date was just, I'm going to say awful. <laughs> <laughs> we were in grad school together. He invited me out, and we went to the Art Institute in Chicago. And he would look at a picture, say, isn't that great? And I'd go through my head, how could he possibly think that's great? <laughs> and I started, as time wore on, becoming more vocal about, seriously? What are you seeing in that? <laughs> I'd say, isn't this great? And the response would be the same from him. What are you seeing in that? <laughs> and as we worked our way through the museum, it was very clear there was a distinct difference in our tastes. <clears throat> and we were both very vocal about it. We decided by the end of the date we didn't need to do this anymore. <laughs> Four months later, after continuing to be in the same social circles, we decided to give it another try. Last time I gave this speech, somebody asked, did you ever go back to the Art Institute? Yeah. <laughs> we weren't nuts. <laughs> <laughs> we did come to common ground on things. We learned to support the other person, even if their ideas and thoughts and desires were different than ours. That's part of friendship. We don't need to like the same thing. We don't need to be the same people. We need to be willing to support and enthusiastically encourage the other person to go where they want to go with their life. We did that. We had a deep trust with the each other because we were willing to speak our mind about things. And in 11 years of marriage, he and I never had an argument, aside from the, <laughs> you know, or the Art Institute. But that wasn't really an argument. It was just a difference of opinion on what was good and what was bad. We did have artwork in our house that we both agreed on. <laughs> this wasn't quite as edgy as the Art Institute. So. Mark and I developed that acceptance, that support, that trust, and that willingness to open our heart to the other person. Those are keys to friendship that I find. The friend that I made over the back fence, partially from Simba's help, going over there and inviting himself to the party, happened to be somebody I knew for 32 years until she passed away in January. It's Christy. She was the daughter of the man who lived next door to me. When I moved on to the block, she lived across the street. She moved away for about a year, and then <coughs> bought the house back of me. She lived there for a few years. When he passed away, she moved next door to me. So I, she was my neighbor on three sides. <laughs> <laughs> and Christy was a charming person, a bubbly personality. We had, other than gardening, almost nothing in common. But indicative of who Christy was. Probably a week before she died from terminal cancer, which she had a, four weeks from the time she was diagnosed till she passed away. A week before she died, I went over to help out, spell the hospice people a little bit, and, and take care of Christy. And she happened to be awake. The drugs hadn't taken over her mind that particular time. And I said, good to see you, Christy. And she said, you too. What can I do for you? What can I get for you? She's lying in a bed. They've done surgery on her hip. She can't move. And she's still trying to take care of me. That was just Christy. She would have figured out how to take care of me in some way if I'd asked for anything. She was just that kind of person. I would like to encourage you guys to keep an open mind. I got very lucky with Simba. I got very lucky with Mark. If we hadn't been in the same social circles, it would have been a one-time date. <laughs> Instead, I had a loving-year friendship. And with Christy, if she hadn't continued to be there, I might have never met her and made the long-term friendship. Tonight, we're meeting at Friendship Plaza. I'd like it a theme for tonight that you all learn to treasure the friends in your life, open your hearts, care about them as much as they care about you.
each contestant number five, Steve Orr. Man's best frenemy. Man's best frenemy, Steve Orr. It's cold, black eyes staring at me with burning mouths. A deep, guttural growl. So he rose in his throat till it burst from his lips as his slashing fangs tore into my flesh. One single thought flashed through my brain. Couldn't my parents have picked a nicer pet? <laughs> <laughs> Fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, do you have a best frenemy? Something that seems like a thorn in your side but may end up blooming? In some unexpected way, I found that in my parents' dog, Bo. Bo certainly didn't meet the job description for a man's best friend, or really, even for a casual acquaintance. Yet there he was, occupying the same house as me every time I visited my parents. Even before I met Bo, I heard the stories. How he bit my sister, how he bit my mom, how he bit my other sister. How did my dad? Bo tore through our family like a Swedish smorgasbord. <laughs> he was a cute black terrier. It just might have been the devil. Or as my sister liked to call him, our furry little lawsuit. <laughs> this was not a party dog like Simba. My turn came when Bo jumped up on my lap to be pet. What could be better than a nice belly rub? That was just what he wanted me. In reality, it was all a trick to lure my hand within reach. <laughs> when I heard, <laughs> I knew a little love fest was over. <laughs> I went to push him off my lap, but his head whipped around. He picked out hard on my finger. I tried to shake him loose, but that only made him bite down harder. My mom, shrieking, grabbed a magazine and tried to dislodge a shrieking, biting magazine. <laughs> then finally, finally, he unclamped, dropped to the ground. Blood gushed from my ripped finger. My parents were immediately supportive, saying, That's it! That dog is going straight to the laundry room for the rest of your visit, and then it's going <laughs> right to the pound. <laughs> <clears throat> By the next day, however, they had a chance to think about it and properly assess the blame. You know, Stephen, my pet said, you never should have put your hands near the dog's head, which you should have done. Just tuck him neatly behind your back and then quickly stood up. <laughs> <laughs> that way, the dog's got nothing to bite. <laughs> really, when the dogs fall, they're all. I just didn't know how to live by Bo's rules. <laughs> <laughs> by the end of the week, Bo had free reign of the house, and I was locked in the laundry <laughs> <laughs> Next morning, I got to find out another one of Bo's rules. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. My dad looked really haggard and tired. What's the matter, I asked him. Oh, Bo kicked me out of bed again. <laughs> what? Yeah. Got up to use the bathroom, and when I returned, he'd taken my spot. I had to go sleep on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Who else would do that? That dog was the luckiest dog in the world. I asked my mom why they kept him, given all his issues. She said, well, you think you kids are always angels? I just try to appreciate the good and learn from the bad. What can you learn from a vicious dog? Well, you learn not to put your hands in your mouth. <laughs> <clears throat> On my next visit, I got to find out some more Bo's quirks, including some that were almost endearing. He loved to go for walks in the park, but he was too wild to be in the main cabin of the car. My parents got around that by Make him ride in the trunk. Now you may think that sounds cruel. I can tell you, you do. But Bo loved the trunk. He loved it. Popped the lid. He'd hop right in. This time he got a running start. Left in the air and bam! <laughs> <laughs> and he was so excited, so excited, he hadn't even waited for my dad to open the trunk. <laughs> but he didn't let that phase him. He just looked up as if to say, Hey, I did my part. Where were you? <laughs> so my dad popped the lid. He hopped in. Off they went. Appreciate the good and learn from the bad. 
that my mom was amazing. I learned that Bo dives head first into life. I learned that he doesn't let, a, doesn't let a few hard knocks get him down. And I appreciated that he's actually pretty entertaining. The last time I saw Bo, he was blind and a little bit feeble. He barely had the strength to bite anyone. <laughs> I was quietly cheering the idea that his reign of terrier terror was coming to an end. But nope, here's my mom in the kitchen, whipping him up a gourmet meal that even a sick dog couldn't resist. <clears throat> that dog was the luckiest dog in the world. My dad was also pretty sick around this time with cancer. The sicker he got, the more attached he became to Bo. We sickos gotta stick together, he'd say. You ain't getting rid of us that easy. It's really endearing to see how close they become. My dad was an Indiana farm boy, and not one for much, much emotion. But whenever I looked at him, I thought how under that rough exterior beat a heart could be melted by even the most honorary mutt. That summer, Bo passed away, and my dad passed a few months later. Appreciate the good and learn from the bad. I appreciated that, thanks to Bo, I got one last glimpse of my dad's kindness and grace. I learned, thanks to Bo, I learned that my parents' love was so much more unconditional than I ever could have imagined that if they'd stand by that <clears throat> mongrel menace, then how lucky were we to have them as parents? <laughs> Just about the luckiest kids in the world. <laughs> Maybe things come into your life for a reason. When you meet your own best frenemy, don't discount what lessons adversity can bring into your life. You may be daunted. You may be dismayed, you may be discouraged, but you just may learn something, like I learned. Keep your hands away from his mouth. <laughs> <laughs>
At this time, I would like to invite all of our Table Topics contestants, as well as our Table Topics Toastmaster, to come to the front at this time.
Patrick. Good evening. How are you then? Good. Awesome. Same standard three. How long have you been with Toastmasters? I've been with Toastmasters, I think, for maybe a month now. <laughs> wow. Come on, that's a round of applause. I am with the Town Criers Club in Glen Elm. What is your current Toastmasters designation? My current designation is CR. That's okay. clueless rookie. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Now, you shared this with us in your, in your response to the table topics question. You are a magician. Yes. How long have you been practicing magic? Mm -hmm. And the second part is, what is the one trick that no one has ever, ever learned by that you that you've shown them that they are just totally super? Wow. That's good. Well, I've been doing magic since I was about 10 years old. Um, and professionally, I started to, uh, actually doing magic for money when I was 15, 16. Uh, I, I do all types of magic. I do close-up sleight of hand. I do uh, children's magic. And I also do the larger type illusions as well. Uh, I think the one thing that, uh, I, I won't talk about a trick I do that stupefies people, but there is one secret that I know that always stupefies people. They always ask me, do you know how the name of Copperfield made the Statue of Liberty disappear? And I always tell them, as a matter of fact, I do. And it just slays them, and they always ask me to tell them the secret, but I refuse to tell them. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a personal question. Can you show us a magic trick? Because I really just want to see Sure. I would love to do a trick for you real quick. I'll just do it with this sharpie marker. Oh! Wow! 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 Advanced Communicator Browns. All right, very good. <coughs> I like your quote, but I want to talk about what inspires you the most. And what you wrote is political courage. How do you define what is political courage, and who do you try to emulate in this area? Well, I've never run for office, so there's no one for me to emulate. But true political courage, in my mind, because politicians have to be reelected, is when they do the right thing and essentially act against that interest. They make the hard call and do something. So when they know it's the right thing to do, it will make it difficult for them to be real life. So is there one individual that you think has really summarizes that somebody that maybe in history or in the past that you think really is that person? Not that I've seen lately. <laughs> you go back to Abraham Lincoln if he hadn't been shot probably. I guess we did the same. He certainly did the right thing at a great political cause. Carl, well, thanks so much for participating. <laughs> I don't know what it is. What is Q I Gong or Q Gong? 
It's Qigong. Qigong. Sorry. But what is that exactly? It's an ancient Chinese healing technique <coughs> and meditation technique. So how do you heal people with this? Energy medicine. You know, if somebody's got a blockage that's inhibiting the flow of energy, you focus the energy that's coming from the universe through you onto the blockage and break up the blockage and lower energy. I'm going to go home and read up on that. It sounds interesting. Say, what inspires you most? A good success story. So what is your favorite success story to date? If you have one. <laughs> I, I actually, I run the Chicago Creative Investors Association, which is a group of real estate investors. I've been running that now for a little over 30 years. And I have seen a ton of people go from basically broke, feeling badly about themselves through acquiring enough assets that are income producing that they can be financially free and retire from, you know, if they ever find a job again, <coughs> retire from that or live without a job working for other people. And that inspires me every time that I see that happening. Definitely inspiring. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm looking at your favorite quote, and it's, it's one I've heard before and I, I do like by, by Steve Jobs. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. What do you take away from that, or do you incorporate that in your own life? That's one of the toughest things for me. I have, over the years, as many people do, operated on other people's goals, my parents' goals, my husband's goal. When he passed away, it was, okay, what am I supposed to do now? And that was the point at which I finally realized that I had to be <coughs> I had to work on living my life. And I've had other people come into my life since that wanted to put me to work on what they think I ought to be doing. So I have that particular quote hanging on my desk, on the desk to remind myself that it's what's important to me. That's great. It's, it's got to be about you sometimes. So absolutely. Here's your certificate of participation, and I thank you for competing. Naperville Toastmasters. All right. I've been a member of Toastmasters for eight years. And you're? I am a D team. Okay. okay, and Man's best friend. So I have heard your speech before and had the honor, but it just makes me wonder have you had another dog that you've seen since then that's ever been that vicious? or? I've never seen a dog that vicious. <laughs> <laughs> And, the, and those people have asked me, those stories are all true. As a matter of fact, I had to leave so much out that I could have put in there. Well, the way you describe it, and the evil eyes, and gripping down, and things like that. And I, I honestly think of Cujo, so I get a little okay. scared when you tell that story a little bit. But Thank God it was a uh, 20 pound terrier instead of an 80 pound Cujo. There'd be nothing left on my camera. <laughs> Absolutely. So I see interest in hobbies, travel. Where do you like to travel most, or favorite destination? Well, my wife and I. Did three week, no, two weeks in uh, through Italy a couple of years ago, and that was fantastic. We went through five different cities, traveled all through it. And then last year we went to London, Scotland, and Paris, and we love that. And this year we're going to Croatia, Budapest, and Austria. So can I tag along? Because I've done all the other ones that you noted, but not that last one. So I might have to sneak in your suitcase a little bit there. Inspires you most a new challenge. So do you approach new challenges or do they kind of find you or what do you mean by new challenges? Well, for instance, about three years ago my company started bowling league, so I joined that and yeah, good time to hang out with the guys, have a beer, you know, it was terrible for a couple of seasons. I thought I gotta get better at this. So I bought a my own ball, you know, not too expensive, got a little better. <laughs> and I thought I still have to get better. So then I got a really nice ball and I took some <laughs> lessons and so now if I can get a strike on it, I'm, I'm really upset. <laughs> so it's just like the challenge of trying to take where you are and continue to improve. Much like a toast And I'm going to end this evening because I always like it on a, a super positive note. So your quote by Winston Churchill, this is not the end, this is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Can you enlighten us a little bit why that's your favorite? Well, that inspires me because with achieving my DTM, in some ways, that's the highest level, so you could say, well, I've reached the pinnacle, but it's not. It's really just the start. You've learned the basics, you've ingrained them, but there's always so much room to grow, and that's what I'm looking forward to, all that growth. Absolutely. Well, 
Thank you so much for participating. Our second 
we do appreciate if the second place winners will come to the district contest because it's possible that the uh, first place winner may not be able to attend or is late. And tonight we had both the first and the second place winners not show up in the table topics contest for one area. That's why we only had four contestants. With that said, hope to see all of you on April 24th in the, for the Table Topics Contest and the wonderful uh, talent, talent show. show. <coughs> talent show. Right, and I think we'll probably have Brian do some, some magic. Sure. Awesome. I'll be there. And then again, April 25th, the, the uh, business meeting and some great speakers and, of course, the international speech contest. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you for coming.